next hour, I'm just going to ask Nicholas a couple of questions, and he can say whatever he wants. He can add to it, uh, and I'm going to throw open the floor for a Q&A because the whole point about the centre is to allow uh, the general public to come for five pounds or ten pounds and interact with uh, people whom I regard as uh, inspirational and uh, extraordinary people who have learned their extraordinary life. Now, my first question to you, Nicholas, is this. Um, although you might have a speech to read, I, I don't care, but uh, let me just ask you this question. Uh, the Right Honourable Sir Nicholas Soames, MP, um, grandson of Prime Minister Sir Winston Churchill, related to Duke of Marlborough, um, Blenheim practically your second home, married in the aristocracy uh, twice over, um, and, um, <laughs> and uh, everything which is establishment, uh, query to the Prince of Wales, uh, also a, a great friend of his. How then do you explain that you were born in Croydon? <laughs> <laughs> the exigencies of warfare, I think, probably. Um, I was born as a nursing home in Croydon, and I've always been deeply ashamed. Um, I'm, I'm, not ashamed. I'm not ashamed at all, but every time it says place of birth, I always write London. And when I was um, going to the American customs, they, they had it on a machine, and it said that you weren't born in London, you were born in Croydon, you're clearly a fraud. Uh, and it was only because of my smooth diplomatic skills that I managed to get a that Croydon is part of London. Um, but um, I was born in Croydon because my mother, uh, my grandmother was the patron of a nursing home, which was for the wives of soldiers serving abroad during the war. And after the war, my mother became the patron of the home and felt that she should have her first baby there, so hence I was born there. Yeah. So, Great you know, success, if I may say so. <laughs> and, and the same as Kate Moss. Uh, have you compared notes with Kate Moss? I think she comes no, from No, I would love to compare notes. Not <laughs> <laughs> something that's ever come my way before, but I'd love to do it. You're always threatening to arrange for me to do that, Jack. But so far, you've been a non deliverer <laughs> It's not that, it's just that you haven't been free. Uh, you are so busy, it's very difficult to get, to, to get hold of you. Now, I remember the last, when I was young, uh, when I was still looking up to you as a, a giant of a man, uh, you appeared in the television series uh, as the Secretary of Defense. Uh, did you like that? Um, tell us something about why you did it, because it's not the kind of thing that I would have thought you would want to have done. But you did it, and I thought it was brilliant. And do you regret it? And um, and uh, and was it fun doing it? Is no, it like I fly on the wall. I don't regret it at all. It was a series um, done by the BBC by Jeremy Paxman's partner Elizabeth Clare, who is one of the most distinguished documentary makers in Britain. She's a remarkable woman, and she produced it. And it was directed by a very gifted man called Peter Taylor, who is one of, uh, again, a very distinguished and has made a lot of programs about defense and Northern Ireland, and um, he, he, remarkable. And they came to us at the Ministry of Defense with this proposition. And I was very nervous about it, um, but not, if I may say so, half as nervous as the Chiefs of the Defense staff and the Chief of the Service Chiefs were, who were always banging on about how much they wish that the public would understand more of what they do, but at the first chance of a fly on the wall documentary, they ran mine. And so eventually, we were all persuaded to do it. And um, I was immensely grateful to them, because they, with, there was one rule only in making this film, that they had complete access. Um, they had our diaries a week beforehand, and they said we would like to come to this, that, and the other. But if the conversation at any stage turned towards matters which could not be public knowledge. We said, I'm afraid you must leave now. And on each occasion, they just packed the cameras up and went. They behaved impeccably. And the reason it was so clever of them was that after they'd been doing it for about 10 days, you become completely immune to the, pre the presence of a camera. It's rather like television cameras in the House of Commons. Everyone kicked up the most frightened arrival and said, it will destroy that well. It didn't at all. And actually, you never noticed as a camera. You just don't notice it. So I don't regret it. I think it was, um, actually I think it was a wonderful series. There were four of them, one of which was about me and, well, it was much more important, it was about the Chief of Defence Staff, Peter Inch, who was the most extraordinary man. And he, he came over 
unbelievably well at a very difficult time in the middle of the Bosnian crisis. It was a very, very difficult politically in human rights terms for people. There was a very ugly moment when eight men of Royal Welsh Fusiliers were tied up to a lamppost in a place called Garajna, and we really did, we were watching them. And we really did think they were going to be shot. And they captured all that on film and they portrayed it in the, 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 the sort of immense tension of a time like that came across very well. And I thought the really important thing was that the great men of the services came across as what they are, which is decent, humane, brave, clever, and just very good at what they do. So I think it was a great success. I recommend it. It's called The Defense of the Rock. You can still get it. If they, if they done it today, would it be any different? To <laughs> um, it would be different because it's a different, it's a slightly different world. I mean, it wouldn't have been, you know, it, it, they should have done it during Afghanistan and Iraq. That would have been a fascinating thing. But now, you know, um, there are no British troops deployed on actual operations anywhere, except when I say that, there are British troops deployed in, um, there, are, there are soldiers on operations in various places. There's no concentrated mass of British military effort anywhere. In fact, um, I have a, a nephew in the, uh, in the House of Cabaret who is absolutely desperate to, to go to war. I mean, they're all, you know, they're all trained, these young men, to, to do the Queen's business. And when it's not happening, they all get quite bored. So it is a different world. Like there's no actual military action going on anywhere. Is the British Army Forces being completed? Well, look, we, uh, we, we live in a world where we're not at conflict with anyone. I mean, the extraordinary thing is that, you know, one of the reasons that I don't understand the, the, the sort of debate in this country about so many things is that we live, we live in this extraordinary world where the world is really at peace. There are some very difficult places to deal with. It's very difficult to deal with Russia. It's very difficult to deal with Iran. There are immense problems in the Middle East. But we don't need an army, probably, that's bigger than about 90,000. And it's about 80,000 strong at the moment. The problem with the British Army, actually, is not something that people ever really talk about. But the problem with the army is that we've got the, we have this extraordinary historic structure in the British Army, which is based on the county regiments and the household division and the parachute regiment and the Royal Marines and the Naval Force. And people are so fantastically loyal to those institutions that the chance of getting any change done. I mean, Harold, Harold McMillan famously said that there are two groups of people that he would never take on, the Durham miners and the household brigade. He's quite right. <laughs> um, so it's very difficult to affect change, but the the great, the great, greatest need in the army today is for sappers, for engi engineers, for logisticians, for a hardcore cadre of highly trained, very deployable infantry. Uh, and of course, we have to get over this great debate that's going on in Europe, where there people talk about there's going to be a European army. There absolutely is not going to be a European army. But as I always have said, there is a European army. It's called NATO. It's just that it's got some Americans in it as well. Um, but, you know, do we need to do cooperate more with the Germans and the French? Of course we do need to cooperate more with the Germans and the French. And we have, with the French, a joint expeditionary force enshrined in a treaty uh, signed in 2010. So our cooperation with overseas forces is very important. And I think the role of the forces now is, is very important in terms of diplomacy and helping our friends abroad all over the world in any way that we can to restore peace and train their own armed forces and all the rest of it. So the armed forces, but how about the Navy? I mean, we hear that uh, Britain is building this amazing carrier, nuclear, uh, and, and everything, but not enough planes to, to go on. Well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm afraid I'm not a, a fan of the carriers, um, and they wouldn't have survived had I still been a defense minister. But the carriers are a vanity project conceived by Gordon Brown to be built in the Resyth shipyard, which they were. The first one is, is going to enter operations in 2017. Um, and the F-35 aircraft, which is the best of its type in the world, will be deployed on or about 2020. But I think the present government may 
a frightful hoardings when they got rid of the smaller carriers and the Harrier aircraft. I think they were, that was a major mistake. I really do, and I argued very strongly against the time, but they, they decided to get rid of them. I think the carriers, you know, they, they, our Navy <coughs> is a real problem for us. We, we, there are only 13 operational frigates in the Navy today. There are three Trident submarines, which enables us to have what is called continuous at sea deterrence, which is exactly what it was throughout the Cold War. Very effective, very, I mean, absolutely fantastic asset to have. And we, mu we must renew that. But the carriers, when they put to sea, they will require a carrier task force to go with them, which will consist of three guided, air guided missile destroyers one submarine and God knows what else. Now that is a third of the entire naval assets, which doesn't leave much to deploy anywhere else in the world. And you know, right now there are ship, British ships, there are two or three British ships in the Gulf, for very obvious reasons. We are using Royal Fleet Auxiliary tankers on operations now in the West Indies to interdict drug smuggling. Um, for our friends in, from China, there is a real problem emerging in the South China Sea, um, and nobody knows how that is going to work out, and to that end the Americans have two carrier routes deployed into the China China Sea. That is an unbelievable range of firepower. And the Chinese feel that this is their area of influence, um, not without, actually without perfectly good, it is their area of influence, but it's also a free passage. We all have passage over the high seas, but it's, it's a place where there's going to be unless we're very careful, a flashpoint over the Spratly Islands and, um, and, over the, and over some of these islands that the Chinese have built in the South China Sea. So I think that is a place to watch, and we don't have enough ships is the answer, and, and um, that has to be. But in fact, if, if, if the Americans were to object to whatever the Chinese would do, which side would they be on? Well, I don't, I'm, I'm afraid, I, I don't want to, I mean, I'm afraid they will quite clearly be on the American side. You think so? Yeah. Not with that George Osborne? No, well, I'm, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, you know, I think we all have it's to be Chinese. Chinese. We have to be very real. George Osborne is more Chinese I, than I, me. I'll tell you what, I, <laughs> think, I, I think the Chinese know exactly what they're doing. And I think rather like, they, they take a playbook out of the Russian playbook which is that you just go on taking the photo in the eye. But you don't take it in the eye hard enough for him to want to do something back to you. And that is the way I think it will go. I think it's going to be a sort of standoff. Um, a standoff. I don't think it's going to come off. But it is an area of, of, you know, you take a, you have a Donald Trump in America. And I would, you know, I would be very leery about, about um, his reaction to this stuff like that. Are you really worried? I am very worried. Yeah. I think it's. Uh, a, I, think it's are, a, I, asked I think the Americans could be about to make a very bad decision. I asked Neil Ferguson uh, a few days ago whether, in fact, he thought uh, he would vote for either Clinton or Trump, and he said that the lesser of two evils was to vote for Clinton. And so I said that he should advise or try to advise Trump, because everybody here has advised namely uh, McCain, uh, uh, Romney, Michael Grove, they've all been failures. So if he advised Trump, perhaps Trump might not get it. Well, I think, you see, I'm not a, I, I'm not a, I'm not a Democrat. I worked for a Republican senator in the United States Senate for a year and a half. I'm very much a Republican, but I would not play a Republican in this next election here in America. And, and I would vote for Hillary. And I think people need to keep, it's one of the things that in all our, life in our public life in this country and in America. I think people have lost all sense of proportion. You know, Hillary Clinton may have serious defects. I mean, you know, who the hell doesn't? But she was an absolutely first class Secretary of State. She was a really competent, capable, clever, experienced woman married to a president who delivered the greatest area, a greatest post-war growth America has ever seen. And uh, she knows what to do. And I think she'd be fine, just fine as President of the United States. 
And actually, I think that, that, that if, um, I know we, we have to be careful what we say um, <coughs> with respect, you know, the office of the President of the United States is a great office. Um, and if, if um, Donald Trump won it, he would be the President of the United States and we would have to do business with him. And we need to remember that. And all our resources would need to be poured into making us have a proper understanding relationship. But I think he will compromise our relationship with NATO. There is no doubt that one of the Trump great assets, I mean, he appeals to a, a bit of America that in particular resents very much the Americans paying for anything overseas. So as NATO makes uh, it, the biggest single contribution to NATO is the American, American contribution, if that was cut away, NATO would rarely cease to be the power that it is in the land, with very great consequences at this time for peace and stability in Europe. And that's why I always argue. European debate, but you can't separate the stability and peace that NATO has brought Europe, which is brought at the end of a gun and, and um, as a result of the last war, at the end of the Cold War, and the peace, stability, and prosperity that the European Union has brought to Europe, which has brought a level of stability which Europe hasn't seen for a thousand years. Now, of the 28 members of the European Union, 22 of them are members of NATO. And if you take a brick out of the NATO wall, it is tough enough to get a decision in the NATO committee as it is, but to take, get a decision for us at the NATO committee, if we weren't even any longer members of the European Union, I think would be very bad news indeed. And so I think it's, it's all part of a very complicated, complex world that we're all trying to deal with. But the point is that it is a world of peace. That's the point. And I think we've lost sight of that. I think we, we've, allowed, we've lost all sense of proportion in our public debate. You only have to listen to this European debate. You know, it's absolutely driving me to dream. And I, 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 I have you given up? I have given up. I went to, um, I've been up in Northampton visiting the um, National Academy of Rail Tech, where the, all the apprentices are trained who work on, on the railways. And these are just the most amazing young men and women, 17, 18, 19 years old, you've ever, ever met. I mean, they're just marvelous. And they're beautifully trained in the most amazing place. And I had, you know, I had a talk to them over, over, over lunch. You know, they, I, because they're young, they're more idealistic but they are absolutely, they are fed up with the debate. Even they, it's got through to them that this debate is, you know, your mortgage is going to go down, your mortgage is going to go down, you're going to do this, you're going to do that. And I think when Boris, who is my old friend, announces that if Britain was to leave the European Union, that it would automatically create 300,000 jobs. I mean, I think that is for the birds. And the German business, Siemens, which owns its enormous training academy, employ 15,000 people in Britain. I can tell you they will not go on employing 15,000 people in Britain if they don't any longer have access to the single market. I was slightly worried that Brexit might win. Yes, I am worried about Brexit. I'm worried, I, of course I'm worried. It's a two-horse race. So what happened? You're very familiar with the so, so, so <laughs> what, what will happen if Brexit wins tomorrow on the 24th of June? What will happen if Brexit wins? Do you think, well, first, first of all, Cameron, Cameron the Prime, Prime Minister, the Prime Minister, I assume, will make a statement as to his own future intentions. I mean, I don't want the Prime Minister to go anyway, but he's always already announced his game you know, at the before general election. But I'm assuming that he would say that he will preside over an orderly transition. But I imagine, I, don't, I, don't, I genuinely don't have But uh, you know, I think there will be a leader for the next election. Why don't you run up the future time? Because I, my day is long gone. <laughs> I'm, I'm on the backswing and I'm standing down at the end of the, the, end of the next election. One more question before I ask the, the audience to ask a uh, question. If you had three or four minutes with Donald Trump now, what would you say to him? He's in front of you. He might or might not win and you are in front of him. What would well, you say I, I would say to him, look, with, with great respect, um, <laughs> Mr. Trump, <laughs> um, with great respect, I think if you want to be elected to the Presidency of the United States, which is the most important elected office in the world, 
to which people all over the world, I mean, the United States is a beacon of freedom, democracy, principle, human rights, hope, women's rights. I mean, women all over the world look to the United States. That's why I think Hillary will win this because at the end of the day, I think that Trump's impertinence to, and casualness to women is so repulsive that I think that that's will lose in the election. But if I say if you're really serious about wanting to be president, you have to understand that what you say matters way beyond the borders of Minnesota. And everything that you say is parsed, analyzed to the nth degree in every capital city in the world. And if you are to be elected, and you are elected, you are going to be elected to a world that is dreading your election. So why don't you make it a plus rather than a minus? And you know, Stand up. start. No, no. Well, why don't you start being a bit realistic about the world as it is? All right. Look, uh, that's what's impressed. Yes. Well, one minute. Let's get the microphone. Uh, I just want to respect. Uh, thank you very much for coming tonight. It's very insightful. Indeed. At what age did you realise that you are grandson of the very greatest? Britain, one of the very greatest Britain in the world. Sorry, when? Well, at what age? When did you realize you were the grandson of Winston Churchill? I mean, there's a very well, famous I, I have my darling brother is here, who, <laughs> who we grew up together at Chartwell. And we grew up in a, in, you know, my grandfather lived at Chartwell. My mother, his youngest child, and my father lived in the farmhouse at the foot of the hill of Chartwell. And we grew up with this, with this wonderful figure next door. We saw him every day that he was at home. We would see him really when we were little children. So we grew up just as he was a perfectly normal grandfather to us. I don't think, I think it's one of the cleverest things that my parents did. I don't know if my brother Jeremy agrees with me, I think he will. I think one of the cleverest things that my parents ever did with this was never to make a big issue. It was never a big deal. He was just grandpa. And of course we knew he was, um, of course, I mean, as you get older, you know, I remember actually going to my brother Jeremy's christening when I was a very little boy, about four. Jeremy's, and there's a picture of I just walking with my grandfather holding his hand and Phil Marshall Montgomery, who was Jeremy's godfather, was behind. And there was, I just remember, age four, this enormous crowd. And I remember thinking, what on earth is this for? You know, I mean, you know, what about, like, it doesn't make a, it doesn't mean anything to you when you're that age. So gradually, as you grow up, it, is, it, it, it becomes part of the thing. But I must tell you something about this. I am a terrible disappointment to audiences in talking about my grandma, because he was a very old man when I could have a grown-up conversation with him. I didn't, so it's always a terrible disappointment to American audiences so that I can't tell them that he said to me, and I look here at my boy, I'm telling you this is <laughs> He never did say any such thing. In fact, I must just tell you, because I hate this way to embarrass my, my family, in particular my, my son, Harry, but Roy Jenkins, in his biography of my grandfather, um, kind of captures Churchill so well as a normal human being. And um, in a postscript to, in the book, and it's incidentally the best one volume book about Churchill ever written. It's absolutely brilliant. And in this note, he, he says at the bottom of the slide, Nicholas Soames, age five, um, I got into my grandfather's room one day, and his room was heavily protected in that his valet or someone was always outside the door to, to you know, he, he was. He, to stop working. Anyway, we got, I got past whoever was there, and I got in with him. And there was this marvelous figure sitting up in bed reading the newspapers with the marmalade cat on the bed and the budgerie guard sitting on the edge of the table and reading the newspapers and paid no attention to him when I got him to all. And so I coughed, and he looked over his glasses, <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, What do you want, boy? And Roy Jenkins says that, my, that I said to my grandfather, is it true, Grandpa, that you're the greatest man in the world? Long pause. Yes, now bugger off and leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a normal 
relationship. And we did, when we used to go and say, Jerry, Jerry would have had, Jeremy had exactly the same experience. When we used to go and say goodbye before we went away to prep school, before we went away, my mother used to send us up to the house to say goodbye to my grandfather. His valet would always put a five pound note under the pillow as a tip. And you know, it was so funny because you could see them sort of ushering you in, and then there was a tremendous performance while it was put on the pillow, which you weren't meant to see. And then my grandfather would say goodbye, and you must, you know, must work at your studies, and, you know, be diligent, and you know, and, so. and, and then, then, and then, and then, and <laughs> and there was a tremendous performance while the five pound note was being. So I looked on him, and I look on him today, that I was so lucky to have someone who was just such a sweet, generous, kind, um, marvellous man. And, and my grandmother exactly the same. They were just our grandparents, and we were very lucky to grow up in, with, with that thing. And, and so um, I don't, you know, I can't, I can't begin to be what he was, um, but I'm just very lucky, and I count myself very honored to have his blood in my veins. I see you have a speech here. Do you want to read that, or no, do you want no, to carry on? No, 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 Yes. I was slightly astonished by the world's reaction to Russia's annexation of Crimea and now what's up to in Ukraine. Um, I wonder whether we should either take back Normandy or respond more forcefully to this kind of behavior. Do you have any views on where Russia's going in the future? Well, it wasn't the French that, um, that, that um, uh, appropriated half the crown there, was it? It was the Russians. Uh, and I think that NATO, I think it's the, you know, I, I so, just to give you, um, give you a scenario which you, you, you try and get your head around because I still can't, okay? I was, some, there are several friends of mine in this room, including my old friend Archie Sterling, who served long before I did, but I was commissioned into the British Army in 1968 at the height of the Cold War. And I was posted to Germany, I was in an armoured regiment, and, 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 and um, Simon Murray the same. I was in an armoured regiment in Germany, and we were, our job was to defend eight miles of the River Weser with one regiment of chief and tanks, it was the Dutch on one side and the Germans on the other. And um, I went through my entire army career pretty much based in Germany, trained to fight the Russians and the Warsaw Pact. And then there was that glorious January day in 1989 when the war came back. Do you remember that day? A hallelujah moment, a real amazing earth-shaking moment. And what happened when the war came back? All the countries in the Warsaw Pact that had been lined up with Russia to fight the West joined NATO and all the European Union. And why did they do that? They did that to get the protection, the wealth, the way of life, and the ability to run a proper civilized society out of communist control under the umbrella of the European Union and of NATO. And they ran immediately. I was a defense minister at the time of Partnership for Peace, and I welcomed, I took part, I took part in the parade when the Poles joined NATO. I mean, an unbelievable moment. The Polish army joined NATO. They had five divisions of troops to fight the West. So the West, you know, this was 1989. It's only 70 years ago that the Germans signed the instrument of surrender at Lüneburg Heath. And look at the way the world has gone since that day. There's been the communist takeover of Eastern Europe, the wall came down, Eastern Europe, the Warsaw Pact collapsed, joined the West, rejoined the West, the European Union and NATO, and then Russia starts reasserting itself. Now, now why is Russia starting to reassert itself? Because President Putin, who is a KGB apparatchik of the very first order, who despises the reforms of Gorbachev and the others, believes that Russia was slighted by the West when they, you know, when she was effectively humiliated. I mean, let's face it, the communists lost without a shot being fired. 
believes that the only way to re-establish in a very difficult world in which Russia lives, i.e. a falling oil price, big armed forces, no money to sustain them at the moment, they do what every other country does in the same position, like the Argentine always does with fault dollars. When times get rough, they try and provoke you to create a spirit of things. So they go for the Crimea. Why did they go for Crimea? Because President Khrushchev gave away the Crimea to the Ukraine, say the dinner one night, when he was tight. <laughs> and he believed that that treaty should not stand and that it belonged to them. So they took it back. Now, what is NATO's response to this? Not really very good, because NATO has never had to deal with this before since the end of the close, since the end of the Cold War. And I think the much more serious thing is, is what we do now where the Russians clearly have intentions of, of faking a Russian population in Estonia and Lithuania, which are isn't, and of possibly interfering with Lithuania and Estonia. And if they invade, if they were to undertake a similar action in the Baltic <coughs> states, I think that would be an Article 5 breach of the NATO Charter, which is a, an act of war against one, is an act of war against all. And I think that would be a very serious thing. And I don't think the Russians will do that, because I think, like a lot of other people, they want to paint the West in the eye wherever they can and see whether or not they can get away with it. To that end, I am very pleased to say that President Obama, two weeks ago, announced the rotation of two more armored brigades through Europe to a permanent base, new base in Eastern Europe. And at the Warsaw Summit in July, I think you will find that there will be an agreement to have a base there, and we will also agree to mount a permanent presence in Eastern Europe, much further forward than, than we have previously been. Now, there will be those who say, well, that is a deliberately provocative act. Well, what is more provocative, us in prevention and deterring, or the Russians in taking down, which they do pretty much every week. Two weeks ago, they took down the entire Swedish banking system. They just took it down to the side. They can take it down overnight. So we have to be aware that we're not fighting a war. It's not going to be a shooting war. It's going to be what they call an asymmetric war. You won't know it's even happening, but it is happening. And just to give you an example, in this country, the most vulnerable things are not just the banks, because of course, you know, if you can't put your um, I mean, I know if I put my cash card into a cash machine, absolutely nothing happens. <laughs> if, if Tango puts his cash card in, it brings sort of thousand pound notes But if, if, if at the end of the day, summed up last time I used it. <laughs> but if at the end of the day, people put their cards in a thing and they can't get their money out, and at the same time, the distribution systems of the supermarkets, on which 87 percent of people in this country rely for their food are disrupted. You would find within 24 hours there'd be no more food on any supermarket shelf anywhere in the room. And it's not very difficult to do. So what we need to make absolutely plain to the Russians, which NATO is doing, is that we're on the case, that we're not, they're not going to do it on the Crimea, that we will not allow interference in the Baltic states, and that we will take steps to do it. Now, at the same time, although nobody ever talks about you, you know, at sea, the Americans, the French, and the British maintain a continuous at sea nuclear deterrent presence. The Russians retain at sea exactly the same thing. And it worked before, and I think it'll work again. But I would, you know, or one needs to be able to know the reason. So serious is the threat of modern war that it will escalate very quickly from being something that you hardly notice into a shooting war where they're using missiles. And that would be catastrophe. So I take it very seriously. <coughs> All right. Well, Sorry, very long winded answer. No, no. <coughs> well, quite right, because Russia is important. Uh, but you have set out the, the deterrence and the, and, the, and the reaction which might follow if they did act um, uh, against uh, all the things that you want. Uh, and you painted a world in which you know, there's a lot of seems to be very peaceful. But isn't what is happening with ISIS something which is simply going to escalate? I mean, isn't that the, the, 
war is going to cause the big trouble. I've been involved in the Middle East for over 30 years, and these the, these movements. I, I mean, you know, my grandfather charged at the Battle of the Omdurman, at the Battle of Omdurman against the Mahdi's men, who were the predecessors of ISIS. They were the Wahhabi, the, the, the militant sect of Islam that believed exactly what ISIS believes. This is a part of the Middle East of the, of the uh, Islamic culture, which has been around for years, but it is a false part of Islamic culture. And actually, Islam is one of the great, I mean, you will correct me, but I believe that Islam is one of the, if you actually read a note or Quran, we will know that Islam is one of the greatest and most peaceful religions in the world, and its extension of hospitality and kindness and justice is unmatched in almost any other religion. All those things are fairly true. Is that true? Fairly true. It's fairly true. true. So, it can mean not true. So, <laughs> well, the, they are. A, a, the, 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 the nation of Islam is basically a peaceful nation, a peaceful religion. And this is a virus within it, which has been there forever. So do I think it upsets the whole world? No, I don't. I think it's a very difficult thing that we have to deal with here in this country, because we have problems of integration. We have problems of very high levels of immigration. We've got to be dealt with. Um, but I don't think it should interrupt the normal passage of our lives. And I cannot get over the sort of thing. But again, it's just one of those problems. That have been that have been with us for years and will be with us for generations. But no, it doesn't keep me awake at night. I don't think it is a fundamental threat to the security of this country. Although from time to time we have to deal with terrorist attacks. But in my lifetime, in the lifetime of one year, we have to deal with terrorist attacks, homegrown terrorist attacks, and not now. Um, you know, it's, it's not something that we're unfamiliar with, or that we should allow to ruin our lives. Anyway. I'm much more worried. I'm much more worried about the, about, you know, I, I, I think the Yemen, Libya, the appalling catastrophe of Syria and the, you know, the 20, <coughs> the 20 million residents of Syria, 11 million of them are displaced, 5 million of them in their own country and 6 million abroad. I mean, that is, <coughs> that is an absolutely appalling destabilization of Jordan and the Lebanon, you know, it's absolutely appalling. I mean, and how we deal with that, I don't know. I think I'm very <coughs> concerned about how we deal with Iran. But, I mean, how we finish the business in Afghanistan, how we, get, how we bring peace and order to Iran, one of the greatest countries in the Middle East, and a country with an unbelievable tradition of scholarship, learning, um, education and everything, just absolutely destroyed from within. But I mean, you mentioned Wahhabism, but that is uh, preached uh, diligently by Saudi Arabia. And um, I mean, Saudi Arabia still has a position in the world uh, to, rec to be reckoned with. So, so well, hey, David, you, you, you have to be, well, I have to be a bit careful how one says it. You say this. I mean, the Saudis, Ibn Saud, did a, a deal, basically, with the Wahhabis when he became king. When I don't think it was Britain who created it, was Churchill um, uh, who created these borders. Um, you know, the sykes pico agreement, whose 100th anniversary was only two weeks ago, created these borders all the way through the Middle East. And so in the side of the he did a deal with them with the Wahhabis, whereby they pretty much had a free reign, providing they left the Saudi royal family alone. And that deal has hung good in Saudi Arabia, but it can't go on hanging good forever. And the Saudis know that, and they are taking steps. But it's very difficult for Saudi Arabia. And you know, it's one of the things in life that where, again, we've lost all sort of sense of proportion about time. You know, in the European island, you know, 70 years ago, the whole of Europe was lying in ruins. France and Germany were a carnal house. There were 20 million people looking at the ruins and wrecks of their homes and their countries. And 70 years later, Europe is the biggest single market, oasis of prosperity, civil rights, peace, and everything else in the world. 
But it's taken 70 years to get there. It's going to take the Saudis a generation to resolve this question of how they're going to organize their lives. And you know, it may be very difficult for them. And there is about to be a very big moment in Saudi Arabia when King Salman dies, and he is an old man. You know, whether or not Prince Naif, the crown prince, actually inherits, or they double jump to this young prince, Salman's second youngest son, Mohammed bin Salman, who is the person who is today running Saudi Arabia. But if they do, if they, they do, but if they, if they decide to break the link between the Sudari seven, the seven wives, the Sudari wives, the children have now run out of that. And if they break that link, I think they are then in a position to say, this is a new Saudi Arabia. But you, we have to be understandable. We have to understand. I mean, the people I am much more critical of, in a way, than the Saudis, are my old friends in Qatar, you know, which allows, you know, you can go and have a whiskey and sabre on the seafront in Doha any day you want. But at the same time, they are preaching and exporting the most virulent forms of Islamic poison to a lot of other countries. Now, they vehemently deny it, but they're doing it. And I don't know what it takes them to stop doing it. And you know, there are, there are <coughs> mosques all over the world. Anyone who's been to Spain, to anywhere where the Saudis would really used to go, will see of these beautiful, small seaside towns. Well, we know one in Marbella. You, know, you drive down the hill, and there's a vast mosque given by uh, King Faisal to the people to, to remember the Arab Islamic influence in Granada. You know, when T.E. Lawrence uh, went to meet uh, Prince Faisal in Mecca, it, it's a wonderful scene, for those who remember it, in the Lawrence, the film of Lawrence of Arabia, of this marvelous young British officer, Arabist, T.E. Lawrence, and his commanding officer was a frightful old stick in the mud. And Prince Faisal ushered him out of the tent. When he heard T. Lawrence complete a verse of the Quran, which had been read for him by his holy man, and he said to Lawrence, but you know, we are, uh, you said of us that we are a small people, a quarrelsome people, a little people. And Lawrence said to him, but sir, the Arabs had lights on the streets of Cordoba when the English were living in wattle huts beside the River Thames. And they were. It was one of the greatest civilizations on Earth. And my view is that they've never recovered from it. And they have to have an Arab Islamic Renaissance, which is free of this terrible poison, which poisons their lives and ours. Except King Rudran in, in Belgium for cheap oil uh, allowed Saudi Arabia to go in there and, and radicalize. Uh, well, there are all sorts of things going on all over the world which are deeply offensive to the way of life which we aspire to. Exactly. Yes, right. Right. here we are. <coughs> I do have an You look like an So I'm what am I meant to be or not to be? I'd rather not be, maybe. That's a different issue. <laughs> the happiest of those never to have been born as a Sophocles. But putting that to one side, you mentioned quite often about getting things out of proportion with regard to the European referendum and with regard to appreciating what's going on in the States and so on. Um, and obviously you were introduced as somebody very much immersed in the establishment. Do you have any reflections on the out of proportion issue of here, I live in Soho, where there are thousands of people sleeping on the streets in London, and your wonderful lifestyle, and Britain allegedly the sixth most wealthiest country in the world. So I wonder about that, out of proportion. How do you address that? What do you think about I, I, I mean, you know, I think that's a perfectly fair point to make. And I think it is, I think it is one of the great failings of our, I think we're approaching a moment in our lives which happens every sort of 40 years in a capitalist country. I think Sir Philip Green's behavior is deeply unsatisfactory. And I think it gives business a really bad name. And it makes people question fairness and justice and social justice <coughs> and wealth 
and the creation of wealth and the distribution of wealth. And all I would say to you, I can't, I'm not going to get into it. I couldn't get into it. With it. You know, I don't like seeing people sneak up. When I, just to give you an example, um, my friend Sir George Young, who was a lovely man, now left the House of Commons, was the housing minister when I was a defence minister. And he came to see me and he said, Do you realize that 60% of the people sleeping rough in London today are ex service people? And I said, I have absolutely no idea. And he said, well, we, we must do a project, and we'll do a project together, and we'll involve one of the great homeless charities, and I can't remember which one it was, but one of the homeless charities, which you have named, which you would be familiar with, and I can't remember it. I think it was based in the, in the big tower. You know the one I mean? Central Point. What? Central Point. Central Point. It was based in Central Point. It's called Central Point. Yeah, it's, sorry, the, was it called some project? Right. Right. Yes, okay. so it was a, and it was a fantastic project. Do you know the, one of the things that was the most extraordinary thing? That, because I went, I followed it very carefully. I'd been a soldier for a short time myself. I had <coughs> very, very anxious that uh, soldiers at the end of their life should not be put in this position. I wanted to know why. 40% of them didn't want to come and live in. They wanted to go on living on the streets. The others, we found accommodation for. But if you're going to deal with homelessness in London, or indeed anywhere else in the country, it requires an enormous act of will and effort. And if you are asking me, do I think the government should make that will and effort? Yes, I do. And it could afford to, sure. And, and I'm quite sure it could afford to. So it's, it's, it's all a question. No, I, I don't think it's ever quite as easy as, as, as saying it. But I, it, the general point that you make is that in, in our day, there should be arrangements for people who want to lead a very much alternative life. And they maybe want to spend some time on the street. And it goes up and down. It goes up and down. And there are all sorts of very complex and complicated reasons why people choose to do it. And there are also the most awful, tragic guts and I would like to see those picked up. And of course I would. I mean, who, who in this room would not want to? But it's not as easy as it sounds. And, you know, the Salvation Army, which is something, an organization which I greatly admire, they run several projects in Westminster, together with Westminster Cathedral. And they, have, they, they, they take these people in every night. And they feed a lot of them. And they help them. But they have, you ask them what the numbers are, they're almost the same as when they first started the project. So it's not an issue that's easy, but do I think it's right? No, and I think there is a great issue abroad in the land today about fairness. And I think people really dislike the idea. The, 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 I, I can tell you that the BHS, uh, the BHS thing is not going to end well. And I think that it's, it's a very unattractive story. And I don't know the ins and outs of it at all, but I, I mean, as, as I understand it to be. And I think it does, it's, it's like um, Ted Heath said of, of Slater Walker, that at the height of their powers, it was the unacceptable face of capitalism. That was Tiny Ronan, wasn't it? Long it was time. Tiny Ronan, I don't remember whether it was. Sorry, it was. I'm so old. Yes, pardon <laughs> um, me. <laughs> Right, thanks very much. So, uh, on a slightly more positive note, what do you think are the um, the best and the happiest or the most positive uh, acts, uh, maybe political or events, maybe political or uh, social or, or literary or artistic, that have happened in your lifetime? Oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> C coming here today. Well, of course, <laughs> beating tigers. <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> Well, do you know something? I, I, I think that we have lost all sense of proportion of the world in which we live. I mean, I mean, I've got them written down here, and I did go into this in a lot of trouble today. And I want to, I want to actually read this out, if I may, because I, 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 I wanted to say this. Um, I think the 20th century. I think the world has emerged from the 20th century in pretty good shape. So if you're asking me about my 33 years in Parliament, if 
you look around the world, you wouldn't really believe from our public discourse today that human beings are getting much healthier, they're happier, they're richer, they're better off. Poverty and infant mortality are falling everywhere, almost everywhere in the world, except in Angola. Uh, to listen to one's friends and contemporaries talking, you think that many of them would believe that nothing is getting better at all. But in a world where illiteracy has more than halved, four-fifths of the world population now attends a school, and global life expectancy has risen from 48 in 1950 to 72 globally, or that the gross domestic product of the world has roughly tripled in the last century. I think that's a pretty good record. So I think that I have been privileged, although I didn't realize it while it was happening, but looking back, with all the problems that we face of a sophisticated, <coughs> still unfair society where the greatest single failure in this country is our educational failure. I can put a finger, I know exactly what to do to make the NHS work better. I know exactly what to do to make uh, education work better, but I can't do it because I'm not in a position to do it. But I know what to do. And it wouldn't take much of a touch on the tiller to make that do. But if you look at the life of the people in this country, it has immeasurably improved in the last 50 years. I cannot put my finger on it. Except that I would say that we live in peace. You know, I, I asked my mother, when she was a very old lady, what she would say if asked what the greatest single achievement of a modern Europe is. And for her generation, it was peace. It was that for the first time for 800 years, an English generation didn't have to go and lay down its lives on French battlefields to preserve the stability, security, and peace of Europe. And the present Duke of Wellington has done it, did a brilliant television interview about what the Iron Duke, what the great Duke of Wellington would have, you know, would have. I mean, he, his whole life was looking at battlefields dead with tens of thousands of Brits, Austrians, French, Germans, all of them. And all the time that he was Prime Minister, he spent against the ultras of the right wing of his party of trying to preserve peace and balance in Europe. So I think actually it's that none of my generation had to go and fight a world war. None of them. And that's an, when you think of the, what the British lost on the first day of the Battle of the Somme, and reflect on that, 68,000 soldiers on the first day of the Battle of the Somme. Thank you. A couple more, that's it. Well, so Nicholas, it's been an absolute fascinating talk, but the question I have for you with your experience of defence and mine, the world, our world for sure, cannot afford two huge platforms in Russia and in the South China, uh, South China Sea, that's for sure. And in terms of how it's been going, Sevastopol is clearly the target, Sevastopol, the Russians are strategically incredibly important. And the Chinese argument, to some extent, is, well, these are unclaimed <laughs> islands, they're disputed islands. In a way, what we're doing is what's happened to Guam, we're claiming them, we're establishing some form of foothold, but that is to secure the air. What the Russians have done is strategically given themselves a second sea access, so it's not just the northern route, but the southern route. How, from a defense perspective, now, would you adjust foreign policy to account for that and say, we need to avoid one of these two. If we can't avoid both, what do we do? Well, I can answer that very easily. Um, it's not a satisfactory answer, but it's the truth. Is that the world now resolves these difficulties through diplomacy. And these are two, China and Russia are two great powers. They are members of the Security Council. They have a role to play in the world. They are part of the polity of nations. This country has a greater experience in international diplomacy, longer probably than anyone else. <coughs> And we've not been clever with it in the last few years, in my view. And I think that we would resolve these differences, and we will resolve them through diplomacy. But the cleverest man ever in my lifetime on diplomacy 
was my father's great friend, Henry Kissinger, who said quite rightly, speak softly, but carry a big stick. <laughs> so it's very, very important that none of these parties to any of these transactions is under any delusion of the determination to keep the peace. I understand completely the Chinese point of view. I've had I've, I've been told on very, very good authority by the Chinese government what their views are and what their position is. I, there are very strong divisions within the American government about the best way to handle this. There are very hawkish um, admirals who feel that the right to preserve free passage in the oceans must be guaranteed, and I agree with that, but there are ways and ways of doing that. One of the ways is diplomacy. I think the Russians are going to be a very difficult, they're very difficult to do with. I think the, 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 I think the Chinese have, you know, already played an extraordinary role in the world today. I mean, you look, there is not a continent in the world where the Chinese are not really big players. I mean, look at the Chinese influence in Africa. I mean, absolutely unbelievable in the second power in the land. So I think that diplomacy, understanding, knowledge, this sort of meeting, discussion, Chinese it, constant contact between China and Britain, between Russia and Britain, very, very difficult to have a conversation with the Russians right now. The, the Foreign Affairs Select Committee has just been to Russia, and I will be one of their members, came back absolutely convinced we've got to talk to them, we've got to, you know, we've got to make a greater effort. And the others came back saying, bloody nearly time to pull the blinds down and get the courts out of the battle. So, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult, but that's the way it'll be done, it'll be done by diplomacy. <coughs> and these, these countries are, you know, China has a point to make. And Chinese space is at stake, and Chinese presence is at stake, and the Chinese military is at stake. There are lots of conflicting pushing and shoving going on in China, just the same as anywhere else. It's just we don't know about it as much as we do in America, and possibly in Russia. But right. diplomacy has to be resolved by diplomacy. Churchill said, jaw, jaw, better than war, war. All right, last question. Yeah. I was intrigued that you mentioned the NHS. Um, I've been a consultant for 40 years in the NHS, and no government seems to be able to approach it correctly. What are your thoughts? No government seems to approach it correctly. Approach it correctly. Yes. Well, I, I, I don't know about approaching correctly, but you know, I, I have been a member of Parliament for 33 years. I have dealt with three very big hospital organisations in that time. They turn over. I mean, they, they they provide the most remarkable and extraordinary service. I mean, I'm a huge. I mean, what they do is just extraordinary. But the way that we do it and the inconsistency in the way that we do it may be rather charming, but it's not a clever way to do it when money is very scarce. And my view on the NHS and on education in this country, and, and, and last night I went to the most fascinating dinner with Sir Michael Wilshaw, who is the head of Ofsted, the body that um, regulates and, and sets the standards for English schools. So they, they absolutely, I mean, he said this before I even got a chance to make my piece with him which is that what we face in these big organizations is the inability of the people who run them to run them really. And there's no in reflection on the consultants or the medical side. I'm talking about non-medical stuff. And I just give you this analogy. And I'm not saying the army is perfect or the service is perfect, but they do know how to organize stuff. So when the floods happen, what does the Ministry of Agriculture do? They hire a logistics major, a brigadier from the Royal Marines, who sorted the thing out in about a week. When we have the terrible crisis of foot and mouth disease, a young brigadier or brigadier Latimer sorted out the whole thing, if you remember, in Cumbria and all that. They still talk about it there. What there isn't in the, in, in the NHS is really good leadership. And it's an organization which is so huge that it depends on everyone knowing what they've got to do and being able to get on together. And I know the difference in the consultants have working with managers, the consultants feel they have a medical right to over 
a medical right to prioritize their patients and their interests over all other things. In the army, you cannot command what is called a higher formation, which is, rank, roughly speaking, a one staff, so brigadier over one, unless you have been to the staff college, and nowadays, unless you've been to what is called the higher command in staff course. If you've done those two things, so in the National Health Service, I want to establish a staff college, which would pick out the young men and women in the organization of the NHS, including the medicals, tap them on the shoulder and say, you are on the purple list. And we're going to accelerate you right the way through this thing, and we're going to give you additional training, and additional expertise, and mentors, and you're going to work under one of our best leaders. And if you, if you sort out the leadership of the NHS, you will sort out 50% of the problems. I'll just give you an example. For Brighton, uh, the Royal Sussex County Hospital in Brighton, which is the hospital trust that looks after the Princess Royal Hospital in Haiti. It's a wonderful, wonderful hospital. Never, I have, I get five complaints a year from professional complainers. It's run by a remarkable woman, a remarkable woman. And how she does it, I don't know, because she was trained, she started life as a midwife, and she then went into the managerial side, and she's gone through it, and she is very good, but she would have had so much more to her abilities if she'd been through that sort of program than if she had just been promoted through the same way you do it, the same way everywhere. And that's not good enough. So I think that is the secret in all business, in the church, in the law, in the police, wherever you go, these great institutions have to be led by real leaders who can instill the ambition, the drive, the aspiration to the people who work for them, and bring everyone with them. That's my view on the NHS. Thank I don't think it's just money, I really don't. Can I make one second? Yes, indeed. Um, I was on an appointments committee at the hospital in Surrey, which was the most impressive to me. And why it was impressive? Because the medical director had been there for 25 years and knew every one of his stuff and went over it each time. And our local hospital, uh, we never see the medical director. We have no communication at all. Well, that's appalling. Exactly. You know, uh, if, 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 you, if, you, if, you, if you take it on the basis of the army, a commanding officer would be everywhere, every day. He'd know the name of every man who worked for him. He'd know the name of every soldier. He'd know, he'd know the inside out. And he didn't even take an outside and shot. You know, it's just rubbish. Of course they should do that. You lead from the front. This lady, this lady, a man, she's called Amanda Federa, I'm a huge fan of her. She is in her nurse's uniform one day a week. She nurses on the ward one day a week in all hospitals, and I think in the children's hospital, in the grown-up hospital, in, in all of them. She's a very visible figure, and she is a leader. And people know her, and they think she's marvelous, and they'll do anything for her. And she's very consensual. But she hasn't had that final stage of really being able to understand how you bring together these huge machines. And it's no disrespect to her. I've told her this to her face. I want her to run the first staff college in the NHS. Well, have you told me to hunt? Sorry? Have you told me to Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all under control. You know, we, <laughs> <laughs> we have people on the National Health Service leadership service. How did you tell 33 years? Run. Yeah, it's nonsense. You have to start. So I'll tell you very interestingly, um, if you can't apply this to the NHS, but I can tell you now, if you know Walmart, Walmart have just hired a lieutenant colonel from the Royal Logistics Corps, who is the superstar of his generation, out of the army, to set up and run a staff training college for their middle managers. They've hired an English officer to do it. When um, I was a defense minister, the, um, the section of defense, Bill Perry, came to see me one day, and I said, look, um, we've both got this problem with Bechtel, who was stealing all the best British and American engineers to run these enormous infrastructure projects. So they would put a British or American officer of 26 years old in charge of 5,000 people, 
and they would build a pipeline for you, a railway, whatever you want. They'd never have a day's trouble. They'd run it like a new show. And so you've got to stop doing this. You could, we've got to stop this, you know, because it's like the, the RAF, all their train pilots are stolen by British Airways. So we now have a deal where they're not allowed to do that. So we could do all this, but it is like the gentleman there said about, said about homelessness, about any other major political problem. It requires an act of will to do it, and they would be dragged kicking and screaming to it. But unless you take people out of these organizations at a young age and tell them, you are on the public list, you know, don't go, don't go to work for Booba or the Princess Grace. You stay here and we will see you right the way through the thing. Then you'll get the best people to run. And you won't have this thing of where you don't see a medical director for one day. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, you should go and run the NHS now. Um, <laughs> and it's the largest employer in the world after the uh, US and France and, uh, and the Chinese Army. That's right. Uh, but it was 1.8 million people shortly. But look, listen, everybody, uh, will you please join me in thanking Nicholas Soames for coming.